today. I'm really happy to be here with Matt Stefan. And uh, the reason I invited Matt to come and join us is that I heard a talk that he gave a couple of weeks ago about reality and truth. And uh, I was really struck with the intersection between that talk and a lot of the things we've been discussing on the channel here. So I wanted to kind of explore Matt's life story, how you came to be the person you are today and the way that you think about things. And then I wanted to tackle this topic of truth and reality. Does that sound good? Yeah, exciting. Okay, so, so tell me how you grew up. Um, yeah, great question. Um, I grew up uh, attending a church, um, you know, went, had a relatively religious family, um, went to uh, a Pentecostal church growing up that um, came to be featured in a documentary called Jesus Camp. Um, <laughs> oh. And so, you know, a lot of great people at that church. Um, it took me a while to process this experience, but I came around to see they really loved me. Um, but the documentary is kind of teasing out, um, yeah, so, some of the unhealthy dynamics of the, this church. Um, and so, you know, that was really, really formative for me. And I took away uh, a couple different things from that. Um, but one was, um, you know, I'm, I, I just kind of from that experience, uh, am a Bible person. Um, I started kind of being involved with that church um, uh, really um, significantly in like the seventh grade. And what must have been like the first week, somebody said, you know, you're supposed to read your Bible every day. So um, the first day of my seventh grade school year, I woke up early and, and I read the Bible and um, that's been a big part of it for me ever since. And, you know, part of it as well for me what was um, digesting this kind of toxic church environment while reading the Bible every day and, and kind of reading the Bible and saying, gosh, I just don't know if we're reading the same text, if we're accessing the same truth and reality. Um, so kind of have been um, on, on part of my life mission is um, understanding the way to read and deploy the Bible that generates life, life giving readings of the Bible. Um, and, you know, that has a lot to do with truth and reality. Um, well, so before, before we get there, let me back up yeah, just sure. a little bit. You said seventh grade was when you started going to this church. But what happened before that? I mean, were you, did you grow up in a Christian family or did you come to this church through a friend or? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, my family was, was um, you know, attending the church and I would go to the Sunday school sometimes. But, um, you know, what the big turning point then was um, my mom made me go to the the student ministry uh, one one summer night. But um, yeah, I grew up in a, a relatively um, spiritual home. I, we were regular church attenders. Um, I think we would have identified as Christians. Um, and kind of that seventh grade year was just where I really came to own it for me um, instead of it being like a family thing. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. So then you went through high school, still involved with this church, and and then did you go to a, a Christian college or um, what was that? Yeah, like? yeah, great question. Um, yeah, um, I ha I had two formative experiences going for me in high school. Um, one was participation in this church, um, and it was formative in two ways. You know, one, I was really involved in the student ministry there. Um, and then two, um, my junior year in high school, this church, um, which, you know, as I said, had some pretty significant unhealthy dynamics going for it, went through like a really painful um, church split where a lot of people left, a lot of my friends left. That was really painful and formative for me. Um, and then at the same time at school, I was part of, um, you know, I was on the debate and forensics team. 
Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I, I was doing policy debate and um, my junior and senior year, you know, my buddy and I, my partner, um, who had been actually my best friend since the first grade, we qualified to like some national tournaments and we won the state tournament. And so um, for me, like my mode of being um, was very cerebral. And so I, I kind of was like, you know, reading the Bible every day, having this really thoughtful approach to it, asking a lot of big questions that kind of weren't welcomed at my church. Um, and then, yeah, I, I kind of graduated high school, um, you know, thinking, in, intending to go to a Christian college, and I ended up going to a Christian college. And then at the same time, sort of thinking, man, if that's what church is like, I don't think I'm ever going back. So um, really, re really wrestling with, um, you know, just the, the genuine warts uh, of um, kind of American Christianity and, um, you know, getting an, an inside look at um, the ways church can, can go wrong, does go wrong. Um, yeah, and the, the human cost uh, of some of that. So, yeah. You know, your story is so similar to the story of so many other people that I've had on. It's just amazing. Mm. Um, it's not just people that have grown up in Pentecostal churches, but but there is a thread that runs through that where there's a, there's some sense of uh, control. You know, it's, it's a kind of, uh, it's paradoxical that when they speak so much of the spirit, there's there's so much authoritarian control within the church that kind of does not allow room for the spirit to work in each each heart so it's a very it's a great paradox there yeah um you know just two thoughts on this topic one is um what i i couldn't name at the time but later learned about <clears throat> the pentecostal movement um, is it has some like explicit sort of anti-intellectualisms um, and, you know, in the 19 teens, when um, the Pentecostal movement was really getting going, they regularly dissuaded people from going to higher institutions of higher education. And the thinking was, well, if Jesus is going to come back soon, like why go to college? Um, in fact, I remember, you know, at that church, people trying to dissuade me from college or especially graduate school. Um, and and in the early days of the Pentecostal movement, um, you know, they would kind of send people all over the world and say, well, if you need to know the language, native language of where you're headed, the Holy Spirit will teach you that. Um, and you know, I, that, oh, that never worked out. <laughs> um, but there's a strand there of um, not intentionally not cultivating the life of the mind. Um, that just rubbed me wrong my whole life. Um, and, I, you know, I retained some really good parts of Pentecostalism. Um, but that part, you know, for me, just had to go as quickly as possible. And I, I couldn't really name it then. Um, but now, um, looking back and learning more about the history of the movement, uh, yeah, that, that's, uh, there's, there's lots maybe of value to, um, the P Pentecostal thinking and theology, but that especially is, is one of the things that contributes to kind of the authoritarian culture that, that you're describing. So, so what did you study in college? Yeah. Um, I, um, you know, kind of, I, when I, when I embarked to college, I was already wrestling with like, um, a pretty colossal internal dynamic because, um, as, as painful as my church experience was, I also sort of carried a undeniable call to ministry, um, and I, sometimes I'll tell people, you know, if you go to if you ever go to church and you look around and you say, I don't think it should be like this, that is probably an inkling that you should be more involved in church and not less that 
you know, the Holy Spirit of Jesus is working on you, um, your instincts are probably right. It should be different and you should, you know, contribute to that. Um, so I was having a lot of that. Um, and then at the same time, um, I had also sort of sworn an oath to myself to never return inside of a church. So feeling a strong call to ministry and make a difference and build healthier churches. And then also like, I never want to go back. Um, so I, I went to a, a small Pentecostal college. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Kansas city and that's just such a wonderful part of the world. Um, and then I, I went to a small Pentecostal college in Southern Missouri. And again, the people loved me, uh, and I loved them and I retained a lot of close friends from that season of my life. And yet at the same time, there are in hindsight, just some kind of real unhealthy dynamics, especially, um, in the spirituality, the spiritual environment um, that I couldn't name, but I could really feel, um, this doesn't feel right to me. Um, and even at an institution of higher learning, just a certain kind of, I don't know, caliber of question um, was not as welcomed, um, yeah, as it needed to be. So I studied, uh, uh, biblical studies, a double major in biblical studies, and then in social science. Um, and that was kind of like a mix of psychology and sociology, which I really treasured. And I just felt like, you know, again, cultivating a, a life of the mind was so important to me. Um, and how do I really marry these things? What What's like a, a sociologically informed, psychologically aware reading of scripture look and feel like? Um, I wouldn't have said that then, but that was kind of my big project in college, um, was, was developing kind of a, a really healthy life-giving reading of scripture. So, well, see, it seemed almost seems like, uh, Jordan Peterson's work would be completely cut out for you. I mean, the sociologically informed, psychologically informed, have you run into his work at all? Um, not enough to to really comment on it um i've watched some youtube I, I think you you need to you need to listen to some of jordan peterson's work i mean maybe start with his college lectures or maybe start with his biblical lectures the biblical series is really quite it's sociology and psychology and anthropology and you know, evolutionary psychology and cosmology and everything all lumped together in one one big pot. <laughs> the lectures are three hours long. And and when you get started on one, you're just sort of glued to it. So you have to start it when you have some time. OK, um, well, can I ask you a favor? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe in the comments of this, you could just post like, what's a great one to start with? Where should I start? Oh, sure. I've, yeah. I've thought of, okay. I've thought about going down that rabbit trail before and, you know, there are three hours and there's kind of a lot of them, or at least that's what I remember. So if you have one you recommend, I'd love to hear it. Well, just for, just for our, the rest of our conversation here, I'm going to play you a little clip that's one minute long Ooh. that, that he used. Um, he gave a talk. He's only ever done this, this one thing once. And he gave a talk at Linfield university maybe three years ago. And he quoted this thing at the beginning. I think it's something he wrote. And then the rest of the talk, he spooled it out. And then at the end of the talk, he brought it all back together again. And so I'm just gonna play the little snippet at the very end of the talk where he brings it all back together again. And uh, not surprisingly, the way that he uses words is idiosyncratic to him you know, as, as, as it is to all of us. But um, let's just take a look at this. And uh, let me share sound here. I got the wrong screen. Wait a minute. Of course. Well, this always happens. Oh, there he is. It does. How? No matter how many times I practice or I, I use Zoom all day long, when it matters, yes, I miss it. I had it. Had it all set up. Had it all spooled up. Here we go. So one minute about truth. 
Okay. It starts with love. Responsibility is something you want because it justifies the suffering of existence. So life is suffering. Love is the desire to see unnecessary suffering ameliorated. Truth is the handmaid of love. Dialogue is the pathway to truth. Humility, that's recognition of personal insufficiency and the willingness to learn. To learn is to die voluntarily and to be born again in great ways and small. So speech must be untrammeled so that dialogue can take place, so that we can all humbly learn, so that truth can serve love, so that suffering can be ameliorated, so that we can all stumble forward towards the kingdom of God. So that is the little piece I wanted to share. And just because the sound was a little bit woggy on that, I'm going to read the text. OK. Life is suffering. Love is the desire to see unnecessary suffering ameliorated. Truth is the handmaiden of love. Dialogue is the pathway to truth. Humility, which is the recognition of personal insufficiency and the willingness to learn. To learn is to die voluntarily and to be born again in great ways and small. Speech must be untrammeled so that dialogue can take place so that we can all humbly learn so that truth can serve love so that suffering can be ameliorated, so that we can all stumble forward towards the kingdom of God. So I've listened to a lot of Jordan Peterson over the last few years. And because of that, I, I hear this in a, in a different way than maybe some people would, because I hear it with every one of these words opens up a lecture in my brain or opens up some deeper concept that he was talking about. But the thing I would really like to talk about here is this one statement that truth is the handmaiden of love. And uh, in order to talk about that, I need to go back to the message that you gave. So you were talking about the truth and the lie and uh, maybe you wanna just Give a little summary of what you mean when you say the truth and the lie. Yeah. Um, man, there's so much there in that in that Jordan Peterson bit. Um, this is really fun to dissect. So thanks for wanting to have this conversation with me. Yeah, in that particular talk, uh, I was assigned the topic um, of conspiracy theories, fake news, um, and truth. And uh, kind of the, the entry point into the, the talk was um, this really big longitudinal study coming out of the University of Miami, Florida um, about conspiracy theories. And they um, got this gigantic longitudinal data set of all the letters to the editor from the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune since 1890. So it's 110,000 letters, and then they coded each one for conspiratorial talk, um, and and then were able to you know kind of ascertain what things going on in America led to an increase in at least conspiratorial talk in letters to the editor, um, and the big takeaway was whoever whoever's um, political party lost the presidential election. Over the next four years, conspiratorial talk in their letters to the editor went up and they tongue in cheek, the authors of this study tongue in cheek said, um, conspiracy theories are for losers, people, and what they meant was it's for people who have um, experienced a, a, a genuine loss um, or have faced like a, a sense of genuine existential threat. And I think there's just something so human there that when we are experiencing a profound loss, we are very, anyone um, is very much willing to believe a comforting lie. And so um, 
you know, one of the big takeaways from this longitudinal study is wh whatever the state of America in 2020, um, no political party is more or less likely to, um, you know, luxuriate in conspiratorial but comforting um, talk. So when I talked about lies in that talk, I meant kind of like the big comforting places where we hide um, that might be, you know, self-deception or um, non-truths about the world that we live in, but that we kind of treasure or find deeply comforting. That's like a really human thing. Um, uh, it's maybe not healthy and a psychologist might call that, well, it's maladaptive. Um, but also kind of in, in the stages of grief thinking, you know, one of the stages is bartering. And I think that's so insightful that um, we're trying to do a deal with the universe. If I believe or do something, even irrationally, will that just make me feel better? Um, that's a part of any grief process and all humans grieve. So yeah, there's a lot there to what predisposes us to believing a big comforting lie about ourselves or the world around us. But yeah, that's kind of what I was unpacking in the talk. Well, the reason I found the talk so interesting was that when you think about, I mean, you were specifically talking about conspiracy theories, but that can scale all the way out and all the way down as well. And when you when you scale it out, I mean, one of the things that Jordan Peterson talks about a lot is how damaging ideologies are, because an ideology is an incomplete, he calls it a crippled religion. It's a it's an incomplete um, only it only tells part of the story. And the part of the story that's missing is probably going to be found in the other guy's ideology, but you don't want to acknowledge that, right? So sure. because you're believing this incomplete thing, and 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 then I've I've also listened to a lot of John Verbeke, who is another psychologist who talks about the meaning crisis in the West. And one of the things that he talks about is that addiction is like a, what does he call it? Progressively narrowing, reciprocally narrowing. So you, once you, you become addicted to something, then that becomes the only thing that is interesting to you. And so that becomes your whole world and your world gets narrower and narrower down to this one small thing. Well, conspiracy theories are like that. You get onto a conspiracy theory, that's all you can think about, right? Or you get you get in an, a party ideology and your side is the only side that's true and all you can do is read the news because what happens you know, in the lens of that party is all that matters in the world. It's all very much like an addiction. And, uh, and, I, and I wanna think about it all the way back to the garden what was if 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 believing the lie is a result of some grief or sadness or trauma what was eve's grief or sadness or trauma that made it so comforting for her to believe the lie that the enemy gave her you know mm. so whenever i think about the lie <laughs> that's sure what i was thinking about yeah maybe because um, her name is karen <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I suffer this dual thing in, in today's world. I'm a woman and I'm a Karen. So totally it's, it's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, I gave a talk over the summer where I talked about the um, cultural phenomenon of what a Karen is. And I expressed sympathy. My name's Matt. It stands for getting stepped on. So Karen's, <laughs> Karen's have their lot in life. I'm sorry. This is your cultural moment. Yeah, I don't um, know about that. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I've never thought about it in those terms. Um, something I was unpacking in my talk about conspiracy theories is there's a it's important to define what we're talking about, because why would someone tell a lie um, is very clear. And I had the fortune of talking to somebody who who works um, in for a think tank, Truth in the Public Sphere. Um, you know, supporting people who are working on telling truth in the, the public sphere. And 
um, we had a great conversation about, well, people tell a lie for the same reason every time, and it's to tinker with the power dynamics. And so I don't know why, and, and sometimes someone tells you a lie and you don't want to believe it. You're not trying to believe a lie. You're not seeking it, uh, comfort in any way. You're just deceived. And sometimes that's not culpable, like on your end. Um, and then sometimes it is, right? Um, and that's kind of tricky to parse out, but certainly part of it in the garden is the snake's desire to deceive. Um, and then interestingly, you know, just from a very close reading, um, like Eve wasn't there when God explained the rules to Adam. And so sometimes Eve gets blamed for believing the snake, but, um, you know, some commentators will say the true fault lies with Adam for not adequately explaining the game, the rules of the game to Eve. Um, so why did Eve, uh, believe that lie? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, that's kind of an interesting take on this topic. I'd have to, to sit with that. It's a great, it's a great call out. Well, I, I did find your comment about a lie being a comforting thing, being very, very interesting. When you, it, I mean, when you really think about every kind of lie that's possible. I had a fascinating conversation the other day with a young woman from Poland who had um, written an essay about how Jordan Peterson had transformed her life. And then she mm. won the essay contest with this, with this essay. And in her case, the lie wasn't um, lies that she was telling as much as the different personas that she was putting forth in order to make herself acceptable in every environment. Mm. And when she heard him talking about one of his big rules is tell the truth, at least don't lie. Because the lie is what turns, even though our world is not perfect right now, the lie will turn it into an absolute hell. Because mm -hmm. he said that's that's how we ended up with Nazi Germany. That's how we ended up with the Soviet Union killing so many people, is that people were willing to go along with the lie, either to repeat the lie that was required of them or to just not stand up to the lie when they heard it. And so speaking the truth and living the truth are vitally, vitally important just for the future of society, even if you're not thinking from a religious standpoint. And um, she made the comment that I thought was so interesting that one of the main things that's necessary for true freedom is a clear conscience. And if you know that you've been lying, you can't possibly, or if you, if, even if you know you've been living a lie or that your life is not lined up with your values, that you can't have a clear conscience. So there's no true freedom there. Mm. Yeah, I love that. Um, you know, I, w one of the things that I think is like adjacent to this conversation is, um, well, really what is freedom? And, um, <clears throat> you know, the in the ancient world, freedom was really transcending yourself and mastering yourself, um, which, you know, is, is a, I think similar in some ways to having a clear conscience or not living a lie. Um, and they would have said, you, you can't really have a healthy democracy until you have people who have um, mastered themselves. Um, and so I think that's really interesting. A couple thousand years later, we define freedom um, completely differently, which is to not master yourself, to have your unfettered, yourself be unfettered and doing what you please. No one should be able to tell you what to do. Um, so to me, uh, freedom and truth um, intersect in really important and powerful, but also evolving ways. Um, and it's real, it's real interesting to kind of, to map that transformation of freedom over time. Well, so when you talk about freedom being the transcending of yourself or the mastering of yourself, you know, within the, within the evangelical church, there are those that accuse the evangelical church of promoting the idea that 
basically the idea of cheap grace that you can, as long as you believe, then you're saved and you know it, everything is taken care of. And to talk about something like transcending yourself or mastering yourself would be to be um, being disobedient to Christ. Because if you were mm -hmm. really being obedient to Christ, you'd just be submitted to him and allow the Holy Spirit to work in you. And it wouldn't be anything about mastering yourself or transcending yourself. So how would you explain that to people? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I think in today's world, um, across the political spectrum in America, both sides tend to define freedom the same way, which is maximized personal autonomy. And, you know, we, if you just stood back and said, I don't, I'm not going to pick a place on the political spectrum. Um, and you listen to someone explain, this is why I should be able to have a gun, uh, or, or this is why, um, you know, we should, we should allow people to have, uh, transgender people to have the same rights and protections as many other protected classes. And if you listen to those explanations and you took out the terms like firearms or transgendered rights, you took out the specific terms, those ex explanations would sound almost identical that, um, who, what, what right do you have to tell people what to do? These are protected freedoms. Um, it has kind of the same explanation. Um, and this is part of it. like every American soul, I think is, um, a deeply held belief that the fewer people that are telling you what to do, the better for you, that that is the pathway to happiness. And I think there's something really countercultural to saying, I'm going to surrender my life to a Lord or master um, who knows better than me. And this is kind of one of the profound um, things that I loved about your quote of just what is humility. It's like this confession of personal inadequacy. So it's deeply countercultural to say, you know, on some level, I need, I am someone who needs a shepherd. I am not my own shepherd. I'm not capable of being my own shepherd. Um, you know, is a scary thing to admit um, and to say, like, I need help. I can't do it alone. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I, I'd kind of unpack some of it that way. Um, and, you know, I think when I, when I said like master yourself, um, or transcend yourself, I think part of that is surrendering, you know, s some thinkers that I, I'm interested in, there's a cultural critic named Mark Sayers, um, who just makes the argument, look, we have excess freedom and it's actually, um, undermining human thriving. Um, rather than enabling it, um, there's a right amount of freedom for us and, and, you know, giving, giving yourself whatever you desire. Like that's kind of, I think how we explain what, what's a dream life. You get whatever you want. Well, that, you know, m most people probably would look into their own hearts and say, you know, if I'm honest, here's where the truth comes in. If I'm honest about myself, if I got everything I want, like that would be bad for me and the people around me. Um, I maybe wouldn't be a very good human if I if I was only on the war path to get whatever I want whenever I wanted it. Um, and yet that is sort of how we defined freedom. That's kind of how we d defined thriving. Everybody likes to say, what will you do when you retire? What will you do if you win the lottery? That's the way we tend to dream. What if I had infinite resources and infinite time that I could just do whatever I want? That'd be the best life I can imagine for myself. So yeah, I think of you know, following Jesus is to um, to limit those things and say, um, I don't I don't always want what is right. I don't always want what is good if I'm honest about looking into my heart. Um, I think that's something probably a lot of people would be able to confess in an honest moment. Um, and then I think the next step, the deeper step, and this is maybe a different topic, but like the deep promise of the Christian faith is God could put different desires in your heart for the best interest of the other person. 
like defining love is good. I like the way Jordan Peterson, um, you know, defined it to alleviate the unnecessary suffering in the world. But how do you become that type of person? And in the Christian faith, we talk about it as, um, you know, a gradual but miraculous process of God planting new desires in you. Where does the desire to alleviate the suffering of the other come from? Um, you know, the Christian faith has a really specific uh, answer to that question. God himself plants that into the human heart. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit of a rabbit trail, but interesting. Isn't Say that again. Isn't it Psalm 37, 4? Hmm. Yeah, there's a good one in Ezekiel. Give me, give me the desires of, give me the desires of. I, tr I, I retranslate it in my mind every time I listen to it as give me the desires of your heart, but I think it's actually give me the desires of my heart. But, but the idea is that the Lord changes my heart so that my desires mm -hmm. are his desires. And, and so that it changes the things that I desire. And it, it took me a long time to come to that place. But um, yeah, I really liked everything that you were saying I, I wish we had more time to talk i know you have a hard stop at 3 30 so i'm just gonna um maybe we could just get started a little bit on these ideas that you put forth about who christ is and then maybe we could have another conversation sometime in the future if that would be okay with you i'd, I'd love that this is so much fun at, at the at the end of your message you made this statement you said jesus is the cosmic christ hmm. And um, I, I think I know what you meant by that, but I wonder if you could just um, elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I mean, some people yeah. hear that with a new age flavor, you know? So. Totally, right. I know, it's really hard to talk about. And, you know, I think any, anybody who talks about the cosmic Christ um, the first thing they need to do is just read the Bible passages, right? Because it does sound a little bit woo-woo. Um, and so to, you know, just kind of anchor it really deeply in scripture, um, I thought maybe I'd just read a couple of them. Um, kind of some of the more famous ones. Um, Hebrews chapter one, verse two. Um, but in these last days, God has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed to be heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. And then in Colossians chapter one, verse 17, um, it's talking about Jesus and it says, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. And then, um, you know, Romans chapter 11, um, for from him and through him and for him are all things. So this really grand scope, and then this idea that the material world um, was created almost like designed, I don't, maybe designed is a loaded word, but um, so I, I won't use that. But if you think of like Jesus as the architect of the universe, Jesus as the instrument of creation, um, and then not only the designer, again, a loaded word, forgive me, ignore the baggage, um, but also the sustainer, the one who keeps it going, who's intimately involved, who's holding it and carrying it. Um, that's kind of what we mean by, by the cosmic Christ. Um, and the implications of this, maybe we don't have time to get into all of it, but the implications of this are something like, well, all things have the fingerprints of, of Jesus Christ on them and in them and not just to create them and wind them up and let them go um, on their merry way, but they're also headed towards Jesus. They're for him, they're to him. And so, um, you know, kind of the, from this way of thinking, the goal of Christian faith, the goal of following Jesus is to see um, everything as sacred all people as sacred all things as sacred every moment as dripping with divine presence and the bible carries this idea from the beginning um, that material things can be the bearer of divine presence 
So for the Hebrews, while their temple, God's presence was in the temple, inhabiting a physical space um, or the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant. The, and then Jesus describes himself as the temple. Um, then later he defines other Christians as temples, physical places where the divine um, presence dwells. And so, um, yeah, if you kind of follow that along, um, you, you get to some, I think, pretty astounding and important places, um, especially in terms of how we treat humans, the sacredness of human life. Well, all material things were made for and through and going back to Jesus. Um, so especially humans are just so sacred and special, and yet we tend to treat them very poorly. Um, we tend to treat the material world as disposable. Um, and so Jesus as kind of the ground for human rights. When human rights were developed, people said, yeah, this, this is kind of the Christian tradition, but let's take the Christian language out of it. Um, or creation care. If all of the material world um, is being held together by Jesus, shouldn't we also care for it in that intimate and powerful way? Um, and then, yeah, coming back to the truth, you know, one of the most cosmic passages in the Bible is Jesus is on trial. Um, and um, the, the person putting him on trial, Pilate, says, are, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus says, well, that's what you say. Um, and then Jesus says back to him uh, at some point, um, you know, about... <clears throat> um, Pilate says, you are a king then. I'm looking at it right here. And then Jesus answers, you say that I'm king. Um, but I was born to testify, to come into the world and testify to the truth. And then Pilate says, what is the truth? And uh, this passage is supposed to be ironic that Pilate is standing across from the truth, um, the one in whom all things were made and in whom all things are held together. And Pilate can't see it. And so Jesus, it, you know, the power of this passage is to um, identify Jesus as the singular truth um, in which all things are held together, in which all things were created, and in which all things are loved. And so I really like this Jordan Peterson quote that truth is the um, handmaiden of love that makes sense um, in, in these passages about Jesus. Yeah, I, I see. Even though, even though he's not inhabiting the same space that we are inhabiting, <laughs> I have a feeling that that the conclusions that he has come to, strictly through his scientific and academic exploration, have led him to some exceedingly deep truths. And I, and I think that's one of them. And. Um, the more that I have listened to him and the more that I've reflected on all of these things, I'm coming almost to the conclusion that truth and reality are the same thing. That, um, yeah, well, that's a, that's a conversation for another time. And, and the other thing I would love to talk to you about is this whole idea of how naming or labeling makes an entity easier to uh, manipulate, easier to handle. And, mm. and there's a lot to be talked about there. And, and it, it kind of goes back to the conspiracy theory thing or the political thing about why we like to label other people because it, it makes their messy complexities easier for us to deal with. And there's a whole, there's a whole boatload of background to that that we can discuss at a future time. But this sure. has been just an absolute delight, Matt, and uh, I hope we get to talk again. I know you're very busy because the church is opening up again this summer. That's right. Yeah, exciting stuff. Um, yeah. You're at, the, you're at the campus in San Mateo, is that right? That's right. Um, yep, we're opening up uh, this Sunday for our first in-person worship, and uh, it's been 16 months, I think. Um, that the campus has been closed. And, you know, part of what's important about thinking of Jesus as the truth is truth isn't an idea. It's something that you live. So we're excited to get back to living uh, our truth of, of gathering. And um, 
yeah, that's going to feel real good, I think. So. so is there anything that you would like me to put in the description section other than a good Jordan Peterson lecture to start with and uh, maybe a link to the church? Yeah, sure. You can put a link to my talk on conspiracy theory since that's what we were kind of um, digesting. And um, yeah, I, I really loved being here. Thanks for having me. Okay. Thanks, Matt. You have a great day. All right, Karen. Bye-bye.